we go. Okay, so now we're recording. Thank you. At least I'm, yes, yes. Okay, good. All right. But anyway, um, these branch chain amino acids um, you know, require the specific branch chain dehydrogenase complex to be fully metabolized, and defects in an enzyme lead to maple syrup urine disease. Um, my plan is to next week maybe talk about a couple of these diseases or actually have you guys talk about them in class. Ooh, yay. You know, pick your favorite uh, fatty acid metabolism or, or uh, um, urea cycle um, disease. All right. Um, there is an interesting aspect to this. Um, degradation of the branch chain amino acids does not occur in the liver. Okay. Um, so uh, the, this is actually takes place uh, outside of the liver. Um, and these branch chain amino acids can be degraded to succinyl CoA. So we'll see that in the citric acid cycle intermediate. Uh, yeah, yeah, in the citric acid cycle, that's where that occurs. Okay. Um, and just to kind of look at some of these, you know, isoleucine, valine, threonine, methionine. Um, yeah, and, and it's actually kind of neat to see homocysteine in here. There's there's so many of these nice little diseases, disease states out there based on defects in these various enzymes. And you can see all these pathways have lots and lots of enzymes. Don't need to memorize all these enzymes. I only want you to know the enzymes for the citric acid cycle for the exam. We'll talk more about that on Tuesday. But um, every place that there's an enzyme, there is a potential for something to go wrong. So there's a potential disease state. And you know, what we tend to see is you know, within certain metabolic pathways, often the diseases that arise from these uh, um, um, enzyme defects will have very similar symptoms. Um, anyway, all of these ultimately get degraded to propionyl CoA. Hopefully that sounds familiar. You recall where we saw propionyl CoA in our fatty acid oxidation of odd chain fatty acids. Um, so we have our three carbon unit attached to coenzyme A. Um, you know, we then convert this into methylmalonyl CoA and then that can be converted into uh, succinyl CoA, all right? So we basically have multiple pathways that are all trending towards making propionyl CoA that can feed into a conversion to succinyl CoA, right? Um, I don't know if it helps you think about it, but one thing that helped me think about was, you know, in you know, whatever small, you know, anytime you're in a town, you've got, you know, like little avenues and roads, maybe kind of residential areas, but they all lead to, you know, one big road. Maybe there's a roundabout there, maybe there's an intersection, but you all get to, you know, the on-ramp to the interstate so you can get wherever you're going. All right. Oh, I just feel I can't do that. All right. Okay. Um, what about our sulfur containing amino acids? All right. We know we have to maintain nitrogen balance, but what about sulfur balance? All right. So sulfur ox the sulfur oxidation state tends to be conserved in the body as well. Um, so if we look at methionine, uh, which has that sulfur in it, and uh, you know, I think we're going to look at cysteine as well too, but methionine degradation will transfer sulfur to serine. And if we basically replace that hydroxyl group on serine with a sulfhydryl group, we'll get cysteine, okay? Um, and then the remaining methionine skeleton um, will, um, you know, go into the, you know, we kind of saw it in the previous picture, um, when methionine can, um, you know, the, the remaining skeleton will ultimately get converted into uh, succinyl CoA. But we go through a multi-step process in here to get the propionyl CoA, then the methylmalonyl CoA, and then to uh, the succinyl CoA. Um, but this initial step here, we end up making this, this homocysteine. We can kind of rearrange that a little bit. And again, you see uh, pyridoxal phosphate, or PLP, is critically involved in so many of these transaminations. So I could ask you a question. Suppose there's a defect in the body's ability to make pyridoxal phosphate. Um, what implications would that have? And you could just write death um, or, you know, a complete breakdown of transaminase. So nitrogen balance will be out of whack, which would likely be a lethal mutation. Right, <laughs> which is what I'd actually rather see than just death. Um, all right, ultimately everything leads to death. Right? Oh, happy, happy, happy rainy Thursday. Okay, um, but anyway, anyway, there. Um, so let's look at a couple of these others. Uh, our, our glucogenic reactions, uh, asparagine and aspartate. Um, so even though they are uh, positively or negatively charged amino acids, respectively, um, they both degrade to oxaloacetate. 
because we basically kind of get rid of our, our in um, portion here. For asparagine, we have a transaminase in here. This is asparaginase that will remove the amino group and that leaves behind aspartate. So essentially asparagine gets converted into aspartate and then aspartate can interact with alpha ketoglutarate to make oxaloacetate. Okay. And you see here, you know, we're, we're adding that uh, um, uh, amino group to alpha ketoglutarate to make glutamate. So that's a very reverse, reversible reaction. And again, just kind of reinforces that pyridoxal phosphate plays a role in there. Um, but uh, we see that we get oxaloacetate from those two. Okay. Um, there are some wonderful um, uh, urea cycle diseases out there. Um, some are worse than others, okay? So I think it's worth kind of looking uh, at a few of these. Um, albinism, um, the defective enzyme is this uh, tyrosinase in here, which basically means that um, we are unable to utilize a tyrosine as a precursor for melanin synthesis. So that leads to a lack of pigmentation. Um, so skin is white, hair is white, very, very, very pale uh, people. Uh, eyes tend to be uh, red because there's no pigment in the eyes. Um, that's actually probably one of the biggest dangers in there. Um, people with albinism are susceptible to uh, UV uh, radiation. So you, can, you, know, you need lots of sunscreen or lots of covering up uh, so that you avoid the sun's harmful rays. And uh, there is a risk of blindness because with no melanin content in the eyes, um, the eyes receive a lot of uh, UV uh, radiation and can uh, lead to poor eyesight. But, you know, for, for a lack of tyrosinase, otherwise healthy, you know, it's like, okay, just don't go out in the sun a lot. Everything else is fairly normal in there. Uh, if you look at something like alcaptonurea, um, this is another tyrosine um, pathway deficiency, but it's different instead of being unable to convert tyrosine into uh, melanin. Here, we just can't degrade it. So we have this, uh, this particular enzyme in here, and we end up with dark pigment in urines and late developing arthritis. So presumably there is an accumulation of um, intermediates. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. Uh, WB, I Let me go ahead. There we go. Okay. So um, we've got the uh, arginemia in there. Uh, this one seems to be much more serious uh, with the arginase. Uh, that accumulation results in um, mental retardation. And uh, just, uh, you know, as opposed to the alcaptonuria and the albinism, where, you know, mentally everything is okay, um, arginemia, uh, it is not okay. Um, and that we actually tend to see a lot of these things in the urea synthesis when we have this accumulation, when the nitrogen balance kind of gets out of, out of whack, um, we do see a lot of very serious concerns in here. Uh, vomiting convulsions, lethargy convulsions. I uh, always love this early death, okay? Um, you know, so if CPS1 is not functioning properly, um, you know, if you can't, uh, if you're not making enough of it or it's not functioning properly, you get some really bad effects in there. Um, the homocysteinuria, if we look at that methionine degradation, we saw one of the initial products was uh, homocysteine. Um, and this leads to uh, both faulty bone development and mental retardation. So there's a lot going on with these amino acids throughout the body. So we have, we're talking about multi-organ uh, effects in here. Um, I mentioned the maple syrup urine disease in there, um, or sometimes it's you know, called uh, branch chain ketoacidurea. Um, but if you can't degrade these um, or metabolize these uh, branch chain amino acids, um, you end up with them accumulating, leads to vomiting, convulsions, mental retardation, and early death. So, um, you know, again, if you find, you know, babies whose diapers smell like maple syrup urine disease, test for this and, you know, start making sure that you limit the amount of branch chain amino acids in the diet. Um, now, interestingly, if we look at something like methylmalonyl um, acidemia, um, if we you know, have a defect uh, in the conversion of propionyl-CoA to succinyl-CoA, remember our methylmalonyl-CoA is our intermediate in there. Um, if we have a defect in that enzyme, 
that also ends up being very serious. Your vomiting, convulsions, mental retardation, early death. So not, you know, if, if we're in kind of like the main pathway, so it's kind of like, was it yesterday on the way, way to school? I don't know if anybody drove up 52 and they had the, the truck that flipped over and turned over in there and backed up traffic for miles uh, a lot, and there are lots of delays. Um, that would be an accident or a defect on a major artery, a major pathway in there. And so that has long reaching effects all over the, all over the place. Um, as opposed to something like albinism, where you have a really specific, you know, kind of like singular pathway, not a lot of things are feeding into it. So there's often a, an easier workaround. Same thing for like alcaptanuria. Um, so if we're just looking at one specific amino acid or one particular pathway of one specific amino acid, the, uh, the disease states that arise from a defect in that pathway tend to be less serious than ones that are where we have multiple um, components feeding into it, if that makes sense. Okay. Right. And I think we'd mentioned uh, a phenylketonuria as well too uh, there. So our phenylalanine, um, again, this is a pretty serious disease, even though, you know, again, here we're looking at phenylalanine being converted to tyrosine. So we are affecting multiple um, amino acids in a way. So limiting the amount of phenylalanine in the diet is the uh, treatment for that. And we'll look at some of these um, in more detail here in a bit. Okay, so we've talked about the various amino acids and whether they're ketogenic or glutogenic and, you know, various ways they feed into, um, you know, um, you know like, like the anaplerotic for the citric acid cycle or gluconeogenesis um, and, and talked about transaminases. Uh, we see that glutamate and glutamine in particular play roles as a nit temporary nitrogen storage within the body until you can make a, a urea. Carbamoyl phosphate synthetase one is probably our key enzyme for the urea cycle because it is, is it initiates the uh, the uh, uh, reaction in there. Um, but there are also a ton of cofactors. We said tetrahydrofolate, um, this adomet in there as well, and biotin as well too. Um, and you see biotin tends to transfer uh, carbon dioxide, single carbon transfer involved in that. Tetrahydrofolate does that a bit as well. So does the uh, adomet in there. So all these are single carbon transfers. Um, I always like to kind of interject here. Um, you saw that a lot of these disease states um, resulted in mental uh, uh, retardation in there. So there were some serious mental issues that would arise from this. Um, and, you know, one of the things that uh, probably the, the most significant um, neonatal vitamin is tetrahydrofolate. And you get to get this vitamin B in there, this particular, you know, tetrahydrofolate. Any neonatal supplement, you know, it's like first time, you, you know, a woman goes to um, OBGYN with pregnancy, they're going to give them, you know, a bottle of vitamins because tetrahydrofolate is critical for neural crest tube formation. Um, you know, so making sure that uh, you have enough tetrahydrofolate in the diet will allow the fetus to develop um, and, uh, and, 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 not, uh, and not have a underdeveloped brain. Okay. Um, I, I so I, I want to make jokes, but they're bad jokes. They're not nice jokes. So I'm, I'm resisting the urge. Yeah, my jokes at least should have a point to them. So, um, but uh, tetrahydrofolate is one of our critical components in here. Um, tetrahydrofolate is very versatile. Uh, essential vitamin, like say, uh, you know, if you go to an OBGYN, that's going to be like one of the first things they do. Have this free bottle of vitamins so that we can you know try and promote uh, fetal health and growth. Um, the neat thing about tetrahydrofolate is it can transfer one carbon in a variety of different oxygen states. So we can have, you know, a methyl group, uh, you know, with a hydroxyl attached or a you know, carbonyl in there. Um, and tetrahydrofolate is utilized in a wide range of reactions in there. Okay. Um, generally we're going to see our carbon in tetrahydrofolate, uh, coming from serine, um, but it kind of, it can come from other places. And we see this interconversion, um, on tetrahydrofolate before. The usage in there. Okay. Um, you do not need to know the structure. You just need to know that tetrahydrofolate is a, a, a common cofactor utilized in a lot of these reactions. Okay. Um, if you want to kind of go through uh, this, that might be um, hmm. I'm not going to make you guys know this ahead of time or anything crazy, but um, you know, uh, you you may get 
some question that I'd say, well, suppose, you know, there's a defect in the N5, N10 methylene tetrahydrofolate dehydrogenase. What would you expect to happen there or something? Yeah. Um, all right. Um, and you'll note that we do have some workarounds in here. We do have a reversible reaction for between our tetrahydrofolate and our methylene tetrahydrofolate. Um, but we can also convert directly into these other components in here. All right. Anyway, um, but these different forms of tetrahydrofolate are, you know, we can call these the different active forms. And that's what allow, allows tetrahydrofolate to transfer differently oxidized carbons. Okay. All right. So if we had a defect here, we might not be able to transfer you know, the most oxidized form of carbon, which would probably be bad. You know, and the answer is to all my mutation question. Death, death. No, okay, not really. Um, Adomet is actually better at transferring um, carbon, but specifically methyl groups in here. So if we want to transfer a methyl group, even though tetrahydrofolate can do it, tetrahydrofolate is more versatile. It can do everything. Um, Adomet is maybe a specialist. It can transfer methyl groups really well. Um, so like a thousand times more reactive than uh, tetrahydrofolate. Um, and again, our Adomet uh, is a combination of um, ATP and uh, uh, methionine in here. Okay, so here's our methionine, and you see it's actually the side chain that's bound to the uh, ATP. Um, all right, um, and it's kind of funky here because uh, um, we utilize this N5 methyl form of tetrahydrofolate to regenerate our, uh, our group in here. But uh, this is the methyl group that actually gets transferred in here. Um, Anyway, just, just another nice little single carbon transfer methyl group in there, okay? So what do we take away from this, all right? This chapter 18 summary looks like a lot and it sort of is a lot, um, um, but um, you know, we've talked previously about glucose as an energy source. We've talked about lipids as an energy source. Now we're talking about amino acids as an energy source. Okay, so we covered all three of our bases in there. That's that's everything. Um, you know, um, our first step in amino acid catabolism is the transfer of the amino group uh, somewhere, and that is going to utilize pyridoxal phosphate, our PLP. Um, usually, we transfer it to alpha ketoglutarate to give us L-glutamate. Not always, but usually that's our most common reaction here. Um, we don't want free ammonia. Free ammonia is toxic to mammals at least. So um, we want to recapture that ammonia and convert it into something that can be excreted easily. So we uh, incorporate free ammonia into carbamoyl phosphate and pass that into the urea cycle. So carbamoyl phosphate, carbamoyl phosphate synthetase one is our primary enzyme in there. Uh, we're gonna see bicarbonate being combined with um, ammonia um, and you know, we go through that, you know, to make citrulline, uh, succinyl CoA, you know, whatever, back to ornithine in there. But uh, so knowing that knowing that pathway will be very useful, and knowing the ways that uh, CPS1 is regulated will be important. Um, we've got several bullet points in here where we talk about you know, amino acids, what they can be degraded to. Uh, pyruvate, acetyl CoA, alpha ketoglutarate, succinyl CoA, and/or oxaloacetate. So that you know, if I have multiple choice questions, that might be a good thing. Which of the following is not a compound that uh, amino acids can typically be you know, metabolized into? No, it's terrible, right? Which of the following is not? Um, all right, um, might be a good idea to know which amino acids are ketogenic and which ones are glucogenic. Um, some of them are both. Okay. Um, let's see here, genetic defects. I mean, yeah, um, I'm, I'm almost certainly going to give you, because, you know, we're going to spend the next uh, part of class talking about some of these uh, disease states in here. So you're almost certainly going to see, at least on the take-home portion, um, I'm going to pick some random disease or two or three or something and ask you questions about the pathway in there. Um, the crazy thing about these questions is that, you know, there's a lot of similarities. We saw that with that little chart. Let me just kind of scroll back up. Um, glucogenic. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, if we look a lot of these, um, you know, defects in different enzymes 
result in similar uh, um, symptoms, right? And some of them are wildly different. So, you know, maybe I'll, I, you know, I change this up all the time. Maybe I'll do a compare and contrast or something crazy like that, you know, um, or why is this, why do you think this disease is more serious than another disease, even if they're both in, you know, the amino acid degradation? And, and that's where you'd look at, you know, is this one that's like feeding in the propionyl CoA where all of them feed in that same pathway? And this is our, our big, big highway. Everything's kind of crashing together here. Or is this just like one little tiny metabolite, especially specifically going to one other compound? And, and maybe that one's doesn't have as wide ranging. I, I don't want to say it's not as important, but it doesn't have as wide ranging effects. Um, these ones that tend to you know, um, accumulate uh, products in, in like the center of the big pathways tend to, you know, affect multiple organs and, uh, well, they all tend to affect multiple organs, but tend to have a more systemic effects, I guess. All right. Um, and then, you know, I, I'll, I'll certainly ask some questions about these cofactors and like, what does THF do or what does ADOMET do, you know, Phosphatidoxal phosphate, so um, biotin, you know, um, could fit in there as well too. Um, so that just kind of ties in, kind of knowing what they do. So what I want you to know, and you know, like I say, by Tuesday I will have a a, a you know updated study guide of like what I want you to know for in class stuff, and then you know the take home stuff. It's like everything's fair game. I'm just gonna throw out ridiculous questions and see what you do with them. Um, because I'm mean, no, um, because I want to see how well you can, uh, you know, take this, the, this factual information and, and apply it. Um, I know in the past, I've asked some questions. You know, it's always, you know, I, I always test out some new questions. Um, so how do we, you know, um, um, you know so, some, some of them I don't like as much as others, because one or two of them, you know, ended up being kind of like a scavenger hunt. It's like, can you find this information? Um, and that was me trying to specifically pull stuff out of Lippincott. And I'm like, mm, I don't know if I like that question anymore because it is more of a scavenger hunt and less of a, a uh, yeah. um, I kind of like the, the, the part B to that question though. It's like, well, okay, where does this come from? What happens if, you know, and that's what I want you guys to think about, you know, to have a certain amount of information at your fingertips, but be able to uh, construct a logical um, answer to the what happens if type questions. All right. So, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'll pick out some crazy intermediate enzyme. What happens if? Okay. So, questions about chapter 18. I know that's a, a beefy chapter. Um, there's you know, a, a lot of information crammed in there. Um, but, you know, I, I, if we compare these slides for each chapter to like the previous chapter slides, you know, so far we're looking at, you know, 45 to 60 slides per chapter. Yeah. So it's not that much. And many of these are actually kind of like mechanisms that are broken down over spaces. That's what actually made the citric acid cycle one so long is because each you know, uh, of the eight reactions in there were expl explicitly detailed on their own slide or two slides. And some, I think one of them might even be three slides, but um, so on, on, the good news is these are very focused chapters. The bad news is there's a lot of detail in here. So all we're looking at is, okay, amino acids being used for energy. How do we metabolize them? Okay. We're going to feed everything into the urea cycle, but we have to also keep in mind that all these amino acids can, you know, be ketogenic or glucogenic. We can make oxaloacetate, we can make pyruvate, we can, you know, feed them here, feed them there, feed them everywhere. It's like Dr. Seuss, make a Dr. Seuss rhyme to help keep them straight. I should try that. Hmm. Yeah, I gotta find a little Dr. Seuss hat. You got the whiskers for me. Okay, no, but um. Yeah, I'll, then I'll be like viral on the internet, and it'll be cool. Okay, no. um, that's that's the only important, that, only thing that matters in life, right? Um, anywho, um, um, where was all that? But um, being able to kind of keep those straight, um, and that's that's the challenging part, you know, 
because there's so much that's so interrelated. How do you find a way to say, okay, these branch chain amino acids are different because, you know, we have that branch chain in there. And, you know, um, and that's why I like the case studies um, because they help us focus in on some very specific um, components. Okay. All right, so questions about chapter 18. You guys like just breathe, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going going through the notes is always good. Well, hopefully that's important. Okay, let's stop sharing here. Um, I have a quick question, Dr. Ebert. Oh yes, yeah. Um, so the the uh for the branch chain amino acids, uh, that just includes uh -huh. leucine, isoleucine, and valine. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. No, and and you know you, you see methionine they they had in that chart there as well too, kind of feeding in. So you go back. I just closed the slides, but you go back to that one slide. But mainly those are the only branch chain ones. Those are the ones that are going to be involved with the maple syrup urine disease. Although methionine kind of feeds into that same pathway, it doesn't require the branch chain amino acid dehydrogenase complex that the other three do. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Yes. So I'm. Yeah, I was. I was going to say. Uh, I, I feel bad because you know the one case study, the one I'm going to start with. Um, yeah. Yeah, let's do this one. Okay, I'm going to start with the PDF one first. Uh, where is that? This one. Yes, um, but the but the, but the one that's the Word document where I ask questions, ah, I mistakenly included the second page that has all the answers to them. So, okay, well we'll go. Oh, this is this one. Yeah. So this one's also. Yeah, yeah I'm pretty sure it's 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 in there, but um, I'll check to make I'll check to make sure. Um, and then let me blow this up so you guys can see this. Okay. All right. So I found this one as a fatty acid um, oxidation uh, review. Um, and it is fairly brief because it's only five pages. So I'm like, okay, that's good. Um, but um, we're kind of now stepping back to the previous chapter. So we're kind of jumping a little bit in here. So uh, yeah, I wonder if I could do a comparison. No, no that's too much. Um, but what I like about this is, um, you know, kind of our, our definition, our fatty acid oxidation diseases are you know, this group of defects in the fatty acid transport and the mitochondrial beta oxidation of them. Um, they tend to be inherited. And, you know, because there are so many steps in fatty acid oxidation, there is a wide um, range of clinical presentations. So um, I like our little case report here. We bring in a five-year-old. Okay, this is good because five years old means that there is not something that, you know, has, you know, serious since birth, like our maple syrup urine disease, you know, five-year-old, typically, um, you know, otherwise healthy, um, but suddenly passes out in school and has a blood glucose level of 66. So it's a bit elevated, um, you know, um, gets IV fluids, um, Mother insisted that we have D10. So we, we, what is D10? We have to look at look up some information in here as well. Um, but um, you know, it's known that she has a fatty acid oxidation disease. Okay, um, so she was born. Uh, classification here. Our APGAR scores. Um, it's always kind of funny when things uh, coincide because apparently they were talking about Virginia APGAR at my daughter's um, kindergarten, and so she has a book on Virginia APGAR. Um, anyway, uh, so the APGAR score, and I think actually, was she from here? Or maybe she was associated. Yeah, she, anyway, um, any, whoops, uh, that's one thing I don't like about this. I need smooth scrolling. Okay. Um, hypoglycemia protocol, blood glucose, finger sticks. Uh, okay. Feeds in there. Uh, mild respiratory distress. Okay. Yep, yep. I always like the phototherapy. So I had to tell you guys a uh, story about when my son was born, uh, first child. So keep in mind, my wife is Chinese Indonesian, all right? So when my son was born, 
uh, the doctor said, we have some, you know, we have some mild concerns about uh, um, Billy Rubin, jaundice, jaundice, because he looks a little yellow. And I was like, well, he ought to look a little yellow. Um, yeah, yeah, so there was no jaundice. It was just, you know, natural skin coloration because, you know, Asian genes. So, yeah, so I found that amusing. It's also probably wrong that I refer to him as my little rice cracker. Yep, rice cracker. Oh, I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got it, but like that's terrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You say this only at home, right? Oh, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I know. I know. Well, and it's 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 always interesting to see because you know when when you have mixed race kids you get comments from other people in there too so we're like oh we're gonna head those off and and then of course you find you find the people who take them very and make very serious comments about uh yeah that's that's all one of the things that joke about um you know having moved to the south it's like well you know 30 40 years ago our marriage would be illegal um so uh, anyway um do, 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 breastfeed, uh, so we look here at the background and this is kind of nice because neat because the background gives us the medical history of the patient you know from a child in here and the, the key a component is this mcad deficiency or medium chain acyl coa dehydrogenase deficiency all right so what does that mean you guys recall anything about uh, fatty acids so where does fatty acid oxidation take place? Yeah. Yep, yep, in the mitochondria, <laughs> yep, yep. So we gotta get the fatty acids into the mitochondria, right? So how do the fatty acids get into the mitochondria? I know they got a homie, but I forgot to let them in. Yep, yep. So short chain ones um, that, that I believe are like uh, under, under eight, eight to 12, something like that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, freely diffuse across the membrane. Oh, they yeah. need no no transport. So okay, awesome. Um, medium chain uh, ones, which I think are twelve to sixteen or twelve to eighteen uh, carbons. Yeah, they have a specific transporter that gets them across there. And long chain ones have a different transporter to get them across there. So in this case, we've got a medium chain deficiency. All right. So presumably, short chain and long chain functioning normally just the medium chain ones aren't getting into the mitochondria to be oxidized. So um, that may be where this is coming from, okay? So, and we see here the patient's been hospitalized multiple times for hypoglycemia, okay? All right, so why would we have hypoglycemia if we can't get medium chain fatty acids into uh, the mitochondria, okay? All right. <coughs> So if we look at MCAD deficiency, we can do a little investigation there. Um, and typically we see these things kind of come up early on in life. So not necessarily, you know, at neonatal, not newborn, but usually within, you know, a year or two, we start to see things um, with episodes of hypoglycemia. And of course, sometimes seizures caused by that low blood sugar. Um, so uh, especially if we are undergoing a major diet change in there. So, um, um, we also can see a whole bunch of other stuff that goes on here. Uh, cardiomegaly, uh, the enlarged heart, um, can arise from you know, basically having a fatty heart in there, uh, and that can affect the arrhythmias or the or various myopathies that show up in there. Um, uh, oh yeah, I love this. Here we have this K304E mutation of this particular gene, which um, we can see here we have uh, uh, a lysine to an aspartate. That is a huge change. We're going from positive to negative there. So you know, we may see a pretty major uh, effects from that. Um, all right, hypoglycemia, blood carnitine level. Okay, all right. Um, so our carnitine is involved in our transfers, right? So carnitine plays a significant role in transferring fatty acids into the mitochondria, at least our medium and long chain ones. Uh, 17, I believe. So 18 is urea cycle, 17 is uh, a fatty acid oxidation, and 16 is citric acid cycle. Yeah, well, you can tell I got these memorized, huh? All right. Um, we also see some weird compounds in here, like hexanoyl glycine in the urine. Um, you know, um, so you're basically kind of excreting fatty acids uh, as a soluble form in there. Um, 
right? Um, but you know, you're not going to see that unless it's a very severe uh, uh, here. Um, but if we see elevated uh, elevated eight carbon uh, and ten carbon esters in the uh, in, in the body, then you know that's typically how this starts to get diagnosed. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, treat with carnitine. Why treat with carnitine? You know, since why why would why would you treat uh, this with carnitine? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Is that the carnitine should help get fatty acids into the mitochondria to uh, for metabolism. So even if there's a, even if we're not getting all the medium chain ones in there, maybe it's a carnitine deficiency. Um, you know, but we'll at least get the other fatty acids in there as well too, um, to try and uh, compensate. All right. Um, all right. And I was going to say, I think this paragraph in here is actually probably a pretty significant one. Um, I've avoided highlighting all this, so I guess I want to look at them. Um, but we can really kind of classify our mitochondrial uh, fatty acid oxidation disorders four ways. We can't get long chain fatty acids in there. Um, you know, we can't get uh, this, this intra mitochondrial beta oxidation defects of long chain fatty acids. So once we get them bound, there's something that happens. We can look at beta oxidation defects of short and medium chain ones affecting the enzymes of those components and uh, impaired electron uh, transfer to the respiratory chain, which is probably one of the more serious ones in there, okay? So um, we can look here at the various enzyme deficiencies and kind of break this down. Um, and uh, I kind of like uh, the abbreviation, the MCAD, the SCAD, and is there a VLCAD in there for very long chain ones as well too. So I actually like this little chart up here, table one classifications better than the paragraph in there. All right. All right. So clearly, um, you know, this uh, um, patient is having issues getting uh, medium chain fatty acids in there. Uh, if we look at our carnitine palmitoyl transpyrase one, CPT1, Carnitine, acylcarnitine translocase, and CPT2. So across the outer mitochondrial membrane preparation, across the inner mitochondrial membrane. So we got a bunch of different enzymes that are involved in there. Okay, and this is why you can see in different patients, depending on how severe these defects are and what specific part of the transport pathway, um, you you can see different uh, uh, presentation in there. Okay, all right, uh, so. It could be mild, like mild liver dysfunction, to severe liver disease, um, Ray's syndrome. Well, that's, that's always bad. Um, all right. Um, interesting thing. Um, if you fast, this might uh, um, exacerbate the hepatic disease as well, too. Um, why would that be? Well, if you're fasting, no, uh, no carbohydrates. So you're going to rely more on fatty acids for energy. And if you can't transport fatty acids in, um, you know, or if you have more, you know, if you're, if you're mobilizing fatty acids and only some of them are getting into mitochondria, then you're going to see uh, an accumulation of the uh, metabolic intermediates, which is often what triggers the, uh, the uh, particular symptoms in here. Okay. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. So I always kind of like the, to talk about the prenatal diagnosis a little bit as well, too. Um, so I think about the time period between when, you know, my wife and I had our two kids, you know, we, we did the amniocentesis, amniocentosis and prenatal testing for our son. And I think we had like three, three tests or something like that and tested for like a range of possible things and whatnot. Um, you know, only six years later, we had like five or six tests for my daughter and, you know, it was probably another 50% of type of stuff because so the advances in testing for genetic diseases has come a long way. Um, we also are recognizing a lot more genetic uh, uh, diseases as well too. Um, and they have ways to test for them. All right. Um, if we look at newborns, uh, we can look on uh, acylcarnitine levels in there as well too. Um, and then you know, checking out our various lab work over time can tell us how well maintained these are, okay? So if we look at some of these manifestations, 
um, like this, the CPT1 deficiency, what have we got here? Caesar's coma, hypoglycemia, all that good stuff. CAC2, um, sorry, CACT deficiency, um, you know, mild form will give you hypoglycemia, more severe form, you can, you know, ultimately end up in a coma. So you can kind of look at these very long chain, long chain, medium chain, short chain kind of comparison in here. That's actually one of the reasons why this, this um, um, figure is actually one of the reasons why I like this case study so much, because you have kind of this quick comparison in here of, you know, the, the different ways that the uh, fatty acid oxidation diseases can manifest. Okay. Um, <laughs> got yeah, it, it's terrifying here. You know, um, you always hear about like like uh, students who, you know, maybe a student athlete in high school will have a heart attack and die on the field or something. Like, oh my lord, you know, where was that? You know, some some heart defect or maybe you know some deficiency like this that's unknown. Um, you know, and you end up with a sudden death, these accumulation of very long chains in there. Um, right, and at least uh, fortunately, that's only for like the very long chain ones. Okay, so. Um, when this kid passes out and gets transported to the hospital, um, you know, the, the, the fast term goal is to reverse that hypoglycemia. So that's why, um, you know, you give them uh, a, a, a dextrose solution IV and get uh, um, sugar into the bloodstream so that they can, you know, you know those glycemic levels can rise. Um, you know, so 10% dextrose. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Long-term therapy is we want to kind of stop the fat catabolism by preventing further fatty acid oxidation, okay? okay? So we've got fatty acid oxidation going on. Whenever we have the fatty acid oxidation, we get these medium chain uh, fatty acids. We do not want them to accumulate because that accumulation is what leads to some of the more severe disease states in there. So, you know, don't burn fat, <laughs> basically. Um, now it's interesting because we don't restrict fat in here um, for for MCADs or for mild long chain ones. But if you have a severe form of long chain or very long chain, then you definitely want to restrict fat in there. Um, all right. uh, uh, carnitine is very effective in this because you know it's it's effect on the carnitine transporter. Um, so. Um, and then, of course, liver transplant may be an ultimate consideration, um, assuming there's no neurological disease or other systemic involvement. If you're just getting a fatty liver involved in there from this, then uh, maybe we just need to replace the liver. Um, now, how old is this paper? Uh, 2016. Uh, we're right on the cusp of CRISPR technology here. It's like, huh, could we engineer a way to you know, maybe uh, repair a defective enzyme? Potentially. Um, could we do that in humans? Yeah, maybe. I mean, you know, we, we certainly have a case study now going on in China with the three children for the uh, HIV in there and seeing how, how they grow up and how well they do. But potentially there are, you know, future treatments that are available in here. Okay. Um, but what I like about this is kind of figuring out, you know, um, the information for the child how do you diagnose that? If you see these C8s, we're gonna say, oh, okay, now we're looking at medium chain. Whoops, whoa, too far. Making everybody online go blind here. Okay. It's not on there? Okay, I'll, I'll post it. Okay. Okay, I'll post, I'll, put, I'll make sure that one's posted here after class. Um, I do want to share, uh, I think this is maybe the one you have, the fatty acid oxidation one. Yeah. Yep. I have that one and the one about Yes. Yeah. Yep. So, um, yeah, I definitely want to do this one real quick because this is another fatty acid oxidation one. Um, you know, and, and, and I inadvertently included all the information on there for the stuff in there. Um, but I like, I like this because this is short as opposed to like a five page paper. This is the type of question I could ask you on a take home exam and say, hey, you got a newborn that comes to the ER, they are lethargic, they're irritable, they vomit, they have a lot of diarrhea, um, child doesn't, doesn't eat, seems inter uninterested in food, uh, the child is very thin and lacks muscle tone, so clearly has not been um, you know, getting a lot of food or, or converting it into muscle. Um, there's very low levels of glucose, so they're hypoglycemic. Okay, all this right now is vague, that could be a ton of things. 
more detailed testing is going to show low levels of carnitine and high levels of lysine. Okay. Um, there's also an unusual acyl carnitine metabolite in there, um, and which is later on identified as 2 trans 4 cis decadenoyl carnitine. All right. So what do we make of this? Okay. First thing we should look at is uh, decadenoyl with the oil part in there. I should be thinking um, that sounds like a fatty acid. All right. And since, of course, this is called fatty acid oxidation case study, yeah, that's another clue in there as well, too. Um, but the carnitine should point towards fatty acid oxidation as well, too. Um, and then that name should say, hey, we have some intermediate metabolite going on there. Right. So, oh, yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Oh, I, think, uh, I think pretty much all of these diseases tend to be genetic. Oh. All right, so what's wrong with the child? Well, we're gonna, you know, go ahead and guess a fatty acid oxidation disease since we have this, you know, acyl carnitine molecule and carnitine there, but why the high levels of lysine, okay? So first of all, why are the glucose levels low? So why, why do we have um, um, hypoglycemia? So if we look at the mechanism that's going on in here, we are um, so I think so we're we're going to be kind of affecting a, a gluconeogenesis, I believe in this case, yeah, or you know preventing gluconeogenesis uh, in there. Okay. Um, I actually need to, let's see if I can do this and shift the share. How do I, well, we'll just do it a different way. So if I click on that one link and like I say, Wikipedia is maybe not the greatest uh, place, but it's, um, we're ultimately gonna find out that we have a, a 2 4 dyne oil coa reductase deficiency. And you're like, what the hell is 2 4 dyne oil coa reductase? Well, it's an enzyme that's involved in there. You know those little arrows that say in three steps or seven steps or 12 steps to get here? This is one of those, okay? Um, so we have this particular enzyme in here that is not, um, not uh, um, um, active or not properly active. Um, and the, what, the giveaway that it's this particular uh, enzyme is the lysine levels in there. So with high levels of lysine, uh, that means lysine is not being uh, metabolized. So our 2,4-diene oil coa reductase um, um, is uh, um, you know, uh, indicated by that. Look at my language there. Okay. Um, all right. So we also see low levels of NAD plus in here. Um, all right. So... <coughs> um, where we tend to be lacking some of our uh, uh, electron uh, electron trans, uh, trans, uh, trans electron transfer compounds, yeah, all right. Um, so again, that's why we don't see this uh, lysine degradation because we require NADP uh, in there for that. Okay. Um, so it's kind of neat because when you look at these diseases, you know, it's like when I was born. Nobody knew anything about this, a lot of these diseases here. This was initially described only in 1990, which to me doesn't seem that long ago, but you know, it's now like 30 some years ago. Um, but uh, there are a handful of these in here. Um, and you know, this original child you know, is like, well, we don't know what the hell's wrong with her. So of course she died. Um, <laughs> so you find more, yeah, it's, it's like, yay, we're gonna name a disease after you. Uh, okay. Um, all right. But the low levels of carnitine and that acyl carnitine profile um, are big indicators something's not right in fatty acid oxidation there. Okay. Um, well, there was a second case. Um, I, I, I like this term, failure to thrive. Um, one of the things that I've noticed with pediatricians is that they really are just kind of checking to see is this kid, you know, active, moving around, growing, 
you know, um, you know, they chart, they chart, you know, your height and weight and all that you know, head size and, you know, and all that stuff in there too. But they're really looking to see, hey, is this kid actually doing stuff? If they're constantly lethargic or in the case of this patient or the original patient here, um, lack muscle tone, then that's an indicator that there is something potentially seriously wrong. Okay. Um, Okay, um, and of course now this is one of these things that's up for a newborn screening. Um, what else did I want to go take a look back here? Um, um, I believe so. So not carnitine, and of course the uh, um, uh, treating with the. Uh, uh, So we can look at this, and I think everybody online should be seeing this as well too. Um, and I you know, like this baby's first test. You can see, you can see, I can cite all sorts of stuff in here as well too. Okay, so early signs, you know, if that failure to thrive and that that lack of interest in food, um, dietary treatments. Um, so uh, reducing lysine. Okay, so we don't get a buildup of lysine. Um, and again, you know. I always go back to what is a Greek philosopher who's like all things in moderation. Uh, is that Plato, Socrates? Yeah, it mixes up. Okay. But you know, all things in moderation. Maybe Aristotle. Um, if we have elevated levels of lysine, slight elevation, okay. Gross elevation, then you know that accumulation, you start kind of throwing everything out of whack. Um, all right. So low levels of lysine and treat with carnitine supplements. Okay. Um, so quarantine supplements are going to help break down the fats um, in, in there as well. Okay. Um, expected outcomes. All right. Oh, well, this must be older. Um, <laughs> there, there are now more than one case of this, but again, very, very rare. Um, and when we look at these, um, almost all of these uh, diseases that we're talking about are going to be autosomal recessive genetic conditions. Okay. Um, so there's a defect in the gene and the parents. And uh, usually you have to be uh, homozygous to actually have the disease. Um, not always, but you know, um, let right, me pull up one of these other things that I have in here. Some other questions in there. Uh, should you worry about your child having this disease? So if you guys, you know, move on through life and decide to have kids, is this something you should be concerned about? <laughs> well, well, statistically, I should I should rephrase the question there too. Yeah, if your child does have this, yeah, it's going to be pretty serious. But uh, at this point, there are you know a handful of cases in all the births. So out of millions and millions of people, this is an incredibly unlikely thing. Um, which is why this is probably you know. Well, I don't know. I don't know now. And you know, you get back to the baby's first test. Uh, um, you know. I, it's it's amazing to see how medicine progresses, and like I say, that the, the amount of testing that was done just six years apart for two kids, and you know now my daughter's six, so I'm sure that's grown up. That the level of testing has increased that much more. Um, you can kind of see, okay, what do we have here? You know, um, so you can you know learn a lot about your um, um, baby's health uh, much earlier. And you can also learn more about your health. I mean, I'm, I'm old enough to remember when two people who were going to get married, they had, had to have a blood test to make sure their you know, blood types were compatible or something like that. <laughs> and that was pretty much it. And now that's kind of going out the window. But now you can do genetic testing on yourself to see, you know, do I carry any of these, uh, any of these uh, genes with uh, um, defective genes in there, right? You know, is this something I could pass on? All right. Um, yeah. All right. Um, if we look at like some of these common features, um, oh yeah, and I like the Ray syndrome one in there. Um, yeah, and the common features again. I'm going back to Wikipedia here because you know it's it's helpful. Um, I also really like Nord as well too. Um, but um, we can look at overall uh, things that occur. And this I kind of like as well, too, because here we have a whole bunch of different diseases in here. Um, so just looking at the fatty acid oxidation ones, 
um, or in this case, Wikipedia calls it fatty acid metabolism, metabolism ones, but we're usually talking about oxidation and not synthesis. So I guess that would be catabolism. Um, but they do have some nice pictures in here. Um, our trifunctional mitochondrial uh, um, enzyme in here, um, our carnitine palmitine, carnitine palmitoyl transferases, CPT1 and CPT2, and of course our CACT uh, in the middle in there. Um, we have our common, yeah, signs and symptoms in here. Um, you can kind of see all these tend to uh, uh, show up. So again, the hypoglycemia is one because we are just not, um, you know, getting blood glucose um, to, to good levels. Um, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, fever, poor appetite. You know, that's kind of a pick up here because you know, you're, you're, you're full, you've got lots of food, you've got lots of fat, you're just not breaking down the fat, so it's accumulating. So that's gonna play a role later on with kind of like, you know, I'm not really hungry. I'm just not um, getting the energy out there. And then, um, you know, um, heart issues, Tend to be one as well too because again our, our heart tends to be uh, our muscle that uses uh, the most uh, fatty acids for energy in there so especially if you're accumulating these metabolites in the heart muscle you get fatty fatty heart um, in there same way an enlarged heart that's going to enlarge as well too you can see an enlarged liver as well uh, in some cases um, but uh, you just kind of accumulate these metabolites and they don't really go anywhere. So that causes damage leading to heart failure, uh, all sorts of good stuff in there. Okay. I always like this diagnosis. You know, this is something that requires extensive lab testing because, you know, if you, if you come in with, you know, fever, nausea, diarrhea, vomiting, you know, it's like, well, that could be any, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like, yeah, you know, it's like the sun came up today. It's, yeah. So, um, but <clears throat> even the irritable mood and the sleepiness, not necessarily a good indicator, um, poor appetite, maybe. But the, combining the poor appetite with the hypoglycemia <clears throat> starts to, uh, to uh, um, give you uh, some clues about that. Um, and that's why with a lot of these case studies, they're almost like you know, putting together little mysteries. You know? um, so I really like that Word document. You know, here is a list of things that happen. Um, and you start with the really broad stuff. It's like, okay, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. And here's some Pepto-Bismol. You know? um, but then we start seeing things like, okay, hypoglycemia. Okay, um, you know, excuse me, low carnitine levels. You're like, hmm, interesting. And then we say, oh, we've got this weird metabolite. And then boom, that kind of helps helps get you to the area. I think you talked about going to like an escape room. Um, yeah, so you got to find all the clues and put them together to make our final diagnosis. Um, and I like these because, you know, I'm, I'm interested in medicine and these rare diseases. It's always kind of, you know, neat to, uh, to meet people who, who you know, have some, you know, crazy, unusual disease. It's like, you know, you're one of 37 people in the world. Okay, yeah, it's, uh, maybe it's not maybe it's not necessarily good, but it is a uh, it, it's interesting to learn about the processes in there and see what's happening, and then relate that back to here is how the process of fatty acid oxidation works normally. When something goes wrong, you know how wrong it goes affects how bad the how severe the symptoms are, and you can see all sorts of crazy and stuff going on in there. Um, I am going to now stop sharing this one and pull up the urea cycle one. Okay. There. Is this one? Okay. Urea cycle case study. Ah, there we go. Okay. All right. So this is the hyperammonemia in a 20 year old woman. All right. So I picked this one because many of you are about 20 years old. So, you know. Trying to make it relatable here, right? I'm gonna pull some like old old dude. Okay, um, and I, I really like this case study because this is truly not not a paper. This is just uh, up here. Here's what we have. You know, we got a 20 year old woman with a fever and a cough that aren't responding to amoxicillin. Uh, the patient is lethargic and wheelchair bound, and that's an easy thing to miss in here. It's like, oh wait, you know, patient's in a, in a wheelchair. Okay, um, we can look at this. Um, um, past medical history, static encephalopathy with a double spastic hemiparesis. You're like, oh, we might need to look up and see what that is. Um, but there's a history of seizures and um, um, 
uh, uh, neurological issues in there um, that resulted from uh, meningitis, okay? Um, you can see that the Depakine Depakote uh, is, is in their treatment, treatment, treatment for uh, seizures. Um, I, it's interesting because I knew someone who was on Depakote. What's the other? There's, there are two anti-seizure medications. And yeah, yeah. and, and they, they're, they're both Dep something, but one of them, you know, my friend uh, did not tolerate, like turned bright red like a lobster type rash in there. Like, okay, we're not using this, we'll, do, we'll use the other one in there. Um, but it's typically an anti-seizure medication. Um, I also, uh, for the, whatever the old medication was, um, you know, uh, um, when, of course, we tossed it out. But this was back when I had a, a, a uh, wider range of unsavory friends. And when, I, we, when we tossed out the anti-seizure medication, he's like, why did you do that? I could have gotten you $5 a pill for those. You know, and this is like 20 years ago, too. But I was like, for anti-seizure medication? He's like, yeah. <laughs> so, hmm, interesting. It always kind of makes me think in the back of my mind there. Anyway. We have a list of things that's going up here. Um, physical exam findings, uh, non-ambulatory, resist manipulation, non-verbal uh, scoliosis so in there. Um, no history of drug, alcohol, or tobacco use. So it's like, oh, okay, that's good in there. Um, we look at our principal laboratory findings and we're gonna start seeing some uh, things that may, may stand out here. Um, I like too that, you know, there's patient's result and there's reference level. You look, almost everything is normal, normal, normal as we go down here. Um, you see magnesium is a little bit elevated. You're like, mm, is that something we should look at? Everything else normal. And then our, our bun, okay, so blood, urea, nitrogen, that's pretty significantly elevated as well too. Uh, creatine is normal, this is normal. Well, a little bit low on the albumin, but not very far out of the range there too. Yeah. Yes, that's it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, our liver enzymes are pretty normal, although our ALT is low. Um, that's a little bit low there. Um, you look at the ammonia, ammonia in the bloodstream is very high and the valproic acid is significantly high uh, as well too. So there would be like three or four things we could look at here, okay? Um, and I, I like this, so you can look through the chart and find those, or you could look here at our possible answers as well too. What are the patients striking clinical? Um, fever, lethargy, cough, unresponsive treatment. So it's you know, clearly not some bacterial infection. Um, increased ammonia and valproic acid levels. So even though one of our liver enzymes is low, the other two are fairly normal and they're at the low end uh, in there anyway. So maybe this ALT isn't too bad. The same way with our, our uh, um, bun being a little bit elevated, um, blood urea, urea nitrogen, but we'll see. Um, the ammonia levels and the valproic acid though are very significantly elevated, okay. Um, so what causes um, hyperammonemia? Okay, we can look at a couple of different things, liver disease, urinary tract infection, Ray syndrome, um, urea cycle, enzymes, um, various things in here. And key at the very end is sodium valproate therapy. So if your uh, valproic acid is not being uh, fully metabolized, you may end up with uh, uh, increased levels of uh, ammonia in there. So our most likely diagnosis is since the patient is taking valproic acid, then it, it's probably the valproic acid that is inducing the hyperammonemia, right? Um, and we've got lots of studies that show these links and they're cited here as well too, okay? So for healthy individuals, your GI tract is gonna give you a fair amount of ammonia in there. Um, there's a bunch of bacteria in there. They're going to produce ammonia and your body is going to try and get rid of that, uh, send it to the uh, urea cycle um, in the hepatocytes, okay? Um, in children, hyperammonia is usually a, a, a metabolic issue. Um, so we might see a urea cycle enzyme defect in there. Um, you know, and this is something like 0.03% of people have that. Um, but our valproic acid-induced hyperammonia occurs as a result of disruptions in the urea cycle and the hepatocytes. It's not necessarily completely understood how that, uh, how that happens, um, but we end up um, you know, seeing the valproic acid causing that. So um, we see this, this um, metabolite of valproic acid 
that is elevated in there. Uh, and this can reduce the free coenzyme A and the acetyl-CoA, right? Uh, valproic acid could inhibit the intermolecular you know, the, uh, beta oxidation of long chain fatty acids, and it can cause a deficit in free carnitine, okay? So if we go back up to our questions, like this other six in here, where are we? What other drugs, what are the effects of that? And is the magnitude, you know, is this clinically significant, okay? So like I say, we look at our bun elevation, we're like, eh, yeah, it looks like that would be clinically significant to me too. But what do we, you know, it kind of helps us define clinically significant, all right? All right, there are various other drugs that can uh, induce hyperemanemia, uh, particularly, you know, this could be like one of these kind of drug interactions uh, to pyramate TPA um, can enhance this interaction with the VPA. Um, hyperemanemia can lead to, um, cerebral edema, ischemia, you know, seeing basically induced stroke and death due to herniating the brain, right? Uh, as opposed to herniating the brain by thinking too hard about all this, right? Okay, so is this um, ammonia level, uh, is this val valproic acid clinically significant? And this is what I found interesting. We say no, because our patient's ammonia level is only modestly elevated. So one point, 140% is modestly elevated, okay? Most patients do not typically exhibit signs and symptoms of hyperemonemia until the plasma levels are much, much higher. So we're looking at, you know, you know um, double or triple um, the, the common uh, stuff in there. So um, it's unlikely the patient will become hyperemonemia due to the VPI, the VPA. Um, but this case is illustrating the importance of explaining the abnormal um, laboratory result for some type of analyte, ammonia, that when elevated can have serious consequences, okay? So we go back up to our last two questions here. What's the usual treatment for hyperammonemia uh, hyper and the appropriate specimen collection and handling procedures? All right. So uh, administration of lactulose um, is used to uh, reduce um, nitrogen load from the intestinal lumen. Okay, so this should uh, reduce the uh, uh, nitrogen that's being taken up in here and um, maybe possibly changing the medication, you know, uh, the valproic acid, change it for something that uh, is not known to cause hyperammonemia. Um, how do we analyze uh, ammonia in here? We're looking at venipuncture. Um, uh, we wanna completely fill the tube and stopper it to prevent contamination by ammonia in the air. Like we don't really think about ammonia being in the air too often, but there is uh, enough that could contaminate. Uh, we also want to keep our, our specimens on ice, uh, rotate them as well, um, and testing as quickly as possible. If we don't test it immediately, they should be frozen in there. So plasma ammonia stable for several days um, at negative 70 degrees, but um, at, at higher temperatures, it will degrade and we'll get an incorrect um, um, quantification. Anyway, that's kind of dashing through this. So I, I hope that was kind of interesting. Um, you know, I like these case studies. I may find a similar case study um, for part of the take home and say, hey, you know, and, and, take, and take away the answer part. <laughs> no, um, yeah, but, um, but there's a lot in here. And, and I like this because, you know, when, you know, the first time I read through this, this, I'm like, right, I gotta look up, I gotta look up some medical term, some medical terminology here. And yeah, it's like, what's a hemiparesis, you know? And, uh, you know, and, and then, you know, one of the things that I always still question, and I forget, I know I've looked this up at some point, our blood urea nitrogen, those levels are elevated, but that's likely in part due to um, the effects of the valproic acid and the hyperanemia. Um, so the lactulose should reduce that as well. It would be nice to see a follow-up later on. Um, the other thing I think about is here you have, they don't really say this in here, but the medical history is, you know, this is a person who is wheelchair bound um, you know, and has some cognitive um, decline. Um, so it's not someone who is capable of completely caring for themselves on their own. Their mother essentially has to take care of them. So I'm like, oh, that's not, a, not an optimal situation in there as well too. So you, know, you look at uh, the, the care factor of the, of the medical system. But anyway, well, yes. Can you talk about the, the, uh, the voice to like, like there's some, Mm -hmm. 
interesting. I'll have to look that up. If, you, if you've got a link, send me a link. And... Okay. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Yep, I will. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Yeah. And I wonder if that would be a... Uh... So um, but I'll look that up and I'll find some more information. I haven't heard anything about it yet, but uh, I'll look it up now. But I know we're running out of class time here, so I'll let Janasia and Trent go. So you guys are free to leave. Um, and I guess I can stop recording now, too. Yeah. Leave it.